As I was thinking about what to share through the week, and then last night, I was just looking in Matthew again, and I felt like the Lord just prompted me to take this Sunday to celebrate our children. Just in, you know, we didn't have time to plan anything big, maybe we can do that again, but just in, in terms of um, the, the service, and, and so last night I prayed about it and felt a piece about it this morning. Talked to Phil also this morning, and uh, we felt that it'd be good. I wish Phil, Phil and Katie could have been here too, or Phil and Ajay could have been here too. Uh, but uh, glad that almost all our children are here. And the reason that I felt like the Lord impressed that on me is because for you children, I really had a burden to for you to know that what we do here, you have an important part to play in it you have a very, very important part. And by play, I mean not like you're acting, but you have an important responsibility to be a part of what we do here. I was taught that when I was your age, children. So this service, even if, you're, um, if you don't pay much attention at other times, we understand you're young and it's, you're still learning what it means like to pay attention. Maybe somebody like me, I speak so fast, you can barely understand what I say, but for this message, especially and today, I want you to try especially hard to pay attention, because I'm going to try to share some things, especially for you children. I think it will benefit all of us. I was blessed just to uh, read, you know, to look back here and um, think of these things, and so I hope you will be as well. So children, I've given you a handout that you can follow along. The things that are going to be on the screen are there, and that's for you to take home and for you to uh, for you to keep with you, maybe keep in your Bible if it's useful to you. I hope it is useful to you. And uh, we'll look at this together. Uh, I want to start by looking at a verse in Second Chronicles chapter 31. One habit that I learned, children, when I was young, to bring a Bible to the church meetings. I was given a Bible when I was 10 years old. I still have that Bible. I please... Of, of being given that Bible really came flooding into my mind. So uh, if your parents have given you a Bible, treasure it, value it. And because if you follow along in the Bible, those verses that are read when the brothers are sharing or Phil or I are sharing or others are just enter into your mind from hearing them. I, I'll be honest with you, children that I, I don't think of myself as a very diligent studier of the Bible. I hear a lot of young people ask me, hey, how do you study the Bible? I'll be honest, I, I wish I was a better student of the Bible. And yet it's amazing how much knowledge of the Bible I actually have because simply from I valued it. I can't remember our family ever missing a Sunday or Wednesday meeting unless we had school homework or something like that or we were sick. And I'm very thankful that we were raised with that discipline that I value even now. So remember that, children, and bringing your Bible, if you have one, to the church meetings. Very, very important. It's easier to teach a new dog tricks. There's a saying in the world, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And for some of us who get older, when we try to develop these habits that we should have learned when we were younger better, it's more difficult. It can still be done. The grace of God can change all of that. But if you can start young with these little disciplines, oh, how it will benefit you and how much the Lord will be able to use you down the road. So in 2 Chronicles 31, there's an interesting verse here in verse 18. The, the Holy Spirit takes pains to record in verse 18 that the genealogical, I'm reading verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 31, the genealogical enrollment included all their little children. Don't you love that, children? The Holy Spirit was keeping track of all the people, kind of like the God is looking down from heaven, and He's looking at who all are in this church, River of Life, let's say. And He says, He looks at the little children as well. The genealogical, that means the keeping track of who all are here. Now, we don't do that in our church necessarily, like who's here and who's not. 
But God from heaven, back in the Old Testament, he recorded that keeping track of every name, he even recorded the little children, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. For the whole assembly, for they consecrated themselves faithfully in holiness. Now that word faithful can mean that you do everything, but I believe it also means that you include everyone. And so children, the Holy Spirit has been impressing on my heart since yesterday, especially as I thought about this service, that we, we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit as adults to record the fact and to mention the fact that God knows your name. And He knows that you're here in this church. He knows that you come here to these meetings and pay attention. Now let me show you one more verse in Acts chapter 21. Acts 21 verse 5. This is a church in Tyre. There was a church in Tyre. Tyre was a bad town originally, but then Paul went, I think, and planted a church there. I think it was Paul. And he went and planted a church in Tyre. And it says in verse 3 of Acts 21 that when he had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we, came, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. So they came to this town of Tyre where there was a church. Kind of like they came to Loveland and they, they read, oh yes, there's a church in Loveland called River of Life Christian Fellowship. And this brother who is a godly man is passing through. And for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And after looking up the disciples, back then they only probably had one church in every town. So they're like, where's the disciples of Jesus in this town? And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. Imagine this, this godly man and, uh, and a group of brothers come through and they stay with us for seven days. And they find out where's a wholehearted church that wants to follow Jesus. And they stay with them seven days. And let's keep reading. Um, and when it came, verse 5, about that our days there were ended, we departed and started on our journey while they all... So now the, these brothers are getting ready to leave. And the whole church wants to come and say goodbye to them. And listen to what the Holy Spirit records. They all with wives and children. So the children were part of this meeting these meetings that they had and the conference that they had they all with their wives and their children escorted us until we were out of the city they didn't have planes back then or trains back then they had to walk so the whole church including the children walked along the reason i mentioned those verses before but the reason i mentioned that is because we see that god's work back in the old testament and even when in these new covenant churches included the children he wanted god wanted the children whether they they understood everything, whether they figured it out. And these children, I think some of them could have been little small children like Nahum was just here. You know, he may not understand a lot of what the, is preached from the pulpit, but God knows and says, those little children, they're a part of my work. And I want you to know that, children. Even though we don't get to do this, the first time we've done anything like this, and I'm kind of thankful the Lord has led us this way. Maybe we'll do it every quarter, but however the Lord leads. But know this. If sometimes we as adults get so taken up with adult things in the sense that we are conversations, I like that the Holy Spirit brings us back to the simplicity of it, of Jesus loves me, this I know. And I, I'll tell you honestly, children, I'm asking the Lord to help me to preach in a way that you all can understand more of what I preach. I think that includes speaking slowly, but also that I don't make it so fancy and intellectual or complicated because Jesus was never like that and we we'll look at some of those things so what I wanted to share with you is ten things I've given you ten things now that's a lot we'll just skim through that we may not read all of the verses but the verses are there the references are there so that you can go back this week and look up all of those verses ask your parents if you don't know how to find where a verse is ask your parents to help you and I have a bit of homework for you this week every single one of your children to pay, uh, a, for one, to pay attention to what I'm speaking now, but also to go home and read all of these verses. The first is this. Remember this, children. Jesus loves it when you come to Him. Jesus loves it when he, you come to Him. That's in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. Now, Jesus was having a meeting like this, and I imagine He was probably sitting down. He usually sat down when He spoke. And they were having this meeting where all the adults were, uh, talking about that maybe they were asking him questions well what about God and what does the Torah say about this and what about that verse in Isaiah 
and the children were kind of distracted and a little bit. Um, but then one of the moms, perhaps sitting in the back, thought, you know what? My children want to see where Jesus, what Jesus is doing, and they can't see him, kind of like Zacchaeus. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? He couldn't see. And it wasn't just Zacchaeus who couldn't see. There were little children who couldn't see sometimes. And so their moms tried to bring them in front of, in, into the front. And the disciples, who didn't really know what God was like, they were sitting in the front row, and the diehards, you know, they said, hey, get those children back. Don't let them come near us. We're, we're talking important things. You know what Jesus said? No. You're missing it with all your important things. The children are the most important ones to me. In fact, what Jesus said, this is who heaven was made for. You know when it says, of such is the kingdom of heaven. I would paraphrase it like that. The kingdom of heaven was made for you, children. When God was designing heaven, he thought of children. And you know what? I don't know what heaven's going to be like. Sometimes my children ask me, you think there's going to be football in heaven? Do you think there's going to be candy? What was it the other day you asked me, Zave? I forget. He asked me something. Is there going to be something in heaven? You know, some, something related to children. I thought, I, yes. You know, is, I think it was, is there going to be sweets or something like that? And I said, yes, but it's not going to be nothing like what we have here. It's going to be nothing like candy or anything like that. It's going to be so amazing that we'll forget about the little candy that we thought was so tasty here on this earth. So remember this, children. Jesus loves it when you come to him. He loves it when you come to him. And heaven is made for you. Heaven is made for you. So Jesus loves it when you come to him. The second thing I have on there is that Jesus has left little footprints for you to follow. See, I used to think that Jesus had, you know, has big footprints. When you, when you think about Jesus walking, we want to follow in Jesus' footsteps. How big are Jesus' footsteps? What do you think? How big are Jesus' footsteps? Anybody, any of your children want to answer? Are they, you know, let me show you what a footstep is. I'll, see, I'm, I'm here, if I walk here, that's about how big my normal footstep is. That's maybe, you know, two feet apart. What do you think? How big are Jesus' footsteps? Yes, Dave? Bigger than the church. Bigger than the church, okay. They're huge, okay. What, about, what do you think, Nash? Ten feet. What's that? Ten feet. Ten feet, okay. That's pretty big. What did you say, uh, Rayma? Like this big, okay. What about you, Zoe? As big as a grown man. As big as a grown man, yep, kind of like, I think I'm a grown man. So maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe about what I showed earlier. Any other, yes, Dave, one more? Yeah? Okay, we'll talk about that later in a second. He asked about toys in heaven. That's what it was, yes, toys. Will there be toys in heaven? And I think it's going to be like toys like you can't even imagine. Yes, Amira. About that big? Okay, you know what? You're all correct. Jesus' footsteps are probably bigger than this building because he's God, but they're also about that size, Raymond. They are whatever. Remember it like this. Jesus' footsteps are the size of your footsteps. Whatever your footstep size is, that's the size Jesus' footsteps was. Because Jesus didn't start out like a grown man, right? How big was Jesus' footsteps? Rayma, you're seven, right? How big? You're six, okay. When Jesus was six years old, you know that his footsteps were the same size as yours. Because he was about your size. He was about, he was always one of your ages. And what I mean by that is not just the size of his footsteps. But when he was your age, going through the things that you are going through now, maybe your brother teases you and you want to fight back, but you don't know what to do and you find yourself just, just hitting him back or saying something to them. Do you know that Jesus faced that same situation? He had brothers and sisters who teased him, who stole toys from him, who took things from him. He had a mommy and daddy who told him to do things that in his flesh he didn't want to do. He had a mommy and daddy who, when he was playing with something, said, Okay, Jesus, time for you to put it away and come and help me in the kitchen. And Jesus was tempted. That's what I mean by his footsteps were the same size. At that time, he could have said, But I want to play a little bit longer. But I want to do this. But can you wait for five minutes? And in every single time when Jesus was tempted to say, No, Mom, I want to finish this. He was tempted to say that, but he said, Okay, Mom, I'll come and help you. And when his brother teased him or his sister teased him and pinched him or scratched him or whatever, these are the things that happen in our home. 
uh, you know what Jesus said? He was tempted to hit back or say something back. And every time he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Jesus started out as a little baby. You know, that's what, when, he, when we think about his birth, he started like a little baby. Little baby, smaller than even the smallest baby, which I think is still Catalina, uh, in this room. And, and, and he grew bigger and bigger and bigger. So that you children, at whatever age you are, you would know that Jesus has set you also an example. So when you get to be 15 years old and 18 years old and your, your, your temptations get bigger and you face more difficult things, Jesus is an example for you then too. No matter what you're facing, and even if you're a girl, even though Jesus was a boy, listen to this girls, even though Jesus was a boy, he was tempted in those same points that you as girls are tested. For you who are older in your teenage years, in your 20s, Jesus faced every single temptation point. He didn't, may not have had a body like yours as a girl, even though he had a boy's body and a man's body. He was tempted in those things that you struggle with emotionally. And you think, why did you make me as a girl? Why did you make me like this? Why did you give me this body? Or why did you give me these emotions? You know, Jesus was tested in every single point that you are. That's that verse. Well, in Luke 2 verse 40, it says that the child, the child, he's called. The child grew in wisdom and stature. The child grew. So Jesus was a child, a baby, and he grew up. Remember that. Jesus has left little footprints, the same size as your footprints, for you to follow. The next thing I have on there is that the life of being filled with the Holy Spirit is for you. When you hear us talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's for you children. Let me show you this verse in Acts chapter 2. It's a wonderful verse. Acts chapter 2 verse 39. Acts chapter 2, if you want to read it sometime, which you should, is the story of when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples for the first time. And for the first time, the Holy Spirit could come and dwell inside human beings. And then when this happens, and Peter is talking about it, the people outside are wondering, what happened? The baptism of the Holy Spirit has come for the first time. And then he says in verse 39, Acts chapter 2, verse 39, For this promise is for you and for your children. I love it that the Holy Spirit records that. This promise is for you and for your children. So, the Holy Spirit has recorded. Children, if you're old enough to understand what I'm saying, if you're old enough to pay attention and to understand what I'm saying, which I think is all of you sitting here in these front two rows, God wants you to seek Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It starts by being born again. And you can be born again. Just a few days ago, Vienna came to us and said, Daddy, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want Jesus to come and live in my heart. Now, she doesn't understand the complexities of all of that. And I don't expect her to. Even I don't understand the complexities of it. In fact, I'm trying to get away from the complexities of it. Because it's very simple. Jesus loves you. And He wants to come and live in your heart. You know this, children. But once He lives in your heart, and if you've already asked Jesus to come in your heart, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you haven't, you can do it right now while you're sitting there. You don't have to tell anyone. But afterwards, you could go back and tell mommy and daddy, Daddy, while I was sitting there, I thought I should ask Jesus into my heart. And I just asked him. And you just say quietly, Jesus, please come into my heart. And he does right now. Right in this moment, you can do it quietly. You don't have to make a big fanfare out of it. That's how Jesus wants to come. Because it's between you and him. And he wants to come there and dwell there permanently. And after that, you hear us talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a very big word. I want to break it down for you. It just means that Jesus, having come and lived in you through His Holy Spirit, because it's not actually the person of Jesus who comes and lives in you, even though you ask Jesus to come in your heart. It's His Spirit. Jesus is still in heaven. The physical Jesus is there in heaven. The person of Jesus is in heaven. But His Spirit, which is the same because it's one God, comes and dwells inside of you when you are born again. When you say, Lord Jesus, please come and live in my heart through your Spirit. Please forgive my sins. Cleanse me of all my sin. I repent of them. He comes and He dwells in it. You must believe it. That when you ask Him, He comes. And then He comes and, and it's like a little seed that is born in your heart. And then it wants to grow wants to become a big tree where every part of who you are is filled with the Spirit of Jesus. That's all it means when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That means no matter what age you are, you don't have to, even long before you take baptism in water, you know, 
uh, Xavier and Olivia were asking me about baptism in water. What does that mean? We're working through that in our family. But long before it gets to that, as soon as you're born again, seek for God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus was 30 years old when he was baptized in water. But for those first 29 years, he was full of the Holy Spirit. There was not even one day when Jesus was your age, whatever age you are, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There was not even a day in Jesus' life when he was your age that he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. And like I said, because he's given you those little footsteps, you can say, if Jesus did it when he was my age, I can do it when I'm his, that age, right? Can you say that together with me? I'll say it again and then you repeat after me. If Jesus did it when he was my age, I can do it too. Shall we say that together? If Jesus did it when he was my age, I can do it too. So Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit at the age of seven, at the age of nine, at the age of 11. And he sat there and I'm sure he was tempted when the Pharisees were preaching. And trust me, their, their sermons were pretty boring. Imagine that old long bearded man reading from the Torah. It was very boring because it says there was a veil. They couldn't understand what they were reading. And when somebody doesn't understand what he's reading and tries to preach about it, it's really, really boring. So Jesus was sitting there and the sermons were very boring. But he was sitting there saying, Father, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. How, how must I live now? What can I get out of this boring sermon? Because they're reading from your word. So you can get something even if my sermon is boring. Okay. So the Spirit-filled life, dear children, is for you at your age. Okay, next. Number four, if you're following in your papers. Learn the fear of the Lord while you are young. The fear of the Lord. Now, this is a concept. This is a topic that it'll take a little bit of time for you to understand. Because fear, unfortunately, you're born into a world where fear is painted in a different way. When you think of fear, you think of being afraid. When it says the fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean you must be afraid of God. Never, ever think that. There are some people who think that they must be afraid of God. You must not be afraid of Him in that way, like He's going to hurt you. Uh, but to fear the Lord is to reverence Him. That means to respect Him. And to fear that He is a judge, and that He has the abil ability, like it says, to, th to take away your life when it's, uh, at any given time, and to throw people into hell, and to take them to heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. We must fear God that way. But if you're a young child, remember this, God wants to love you, God loves you, and He wants you to grow up in the fear of Him, which is this, the fear of the Lord will help you not sin. When you fear God, when you're tempted to sin in a particular way, and your temptations will just get bigger and bigger and bigger as you grow up, even in those temptations you have now, if you fear God, you will hate sin. You'll say, I cannot sin like that because I fear God. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world even among so-called Christians who don't fear God. And that's why even though they call themselves Christians, they can sin casually. They can fight with each other. They can divorce each other and remarry and divorce and remarry. They can um, uh, cheat. They can lie. They can kill each other. They can do all kinds of things, take advantage of others. And they don't fear God. And many of these people call themselves Christians. The fear of the Lord will help you avoid sin. And that fear of the Lord will work in your conscience, which all of you have. When you're about to do something wrong, you're about to hit your sister or fight with your brother or grab that thing or be selfish. At that moment, you will, you will hear something in your conscience saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. That's the fear of the Lord working in your conscience. Because God is to be feared, and because you fear God, it will keep, if you do fear God, you will keep you from sin. Proverbs 9 verse 10 said this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the ABC, which means you must start now. Don't wait till you're 18 years old or 25 years old to learn the fear of the Lord. Ask your parents about it. They'll teach you. What does it mean to fear the Lord in this situation? Maybe today at dinner, when you're sitting down together, Daddy, Mommy, tell me, what does it mean to fear the Lord? How do you live that out? And parents, we have an awesome responsibility to teach our children the fear of the Lord now because it's the beginning. If, you want, if we want our children to be wise when they're 18, it starts now in teaching them the fear of the Lord. Learn the fear of the Lord when you are young. Look up those other verses where, where David says in Psalm 34, Come, children. He tells the children, Come, children. Let me teach you the fear of the Lord. Number five. 
You are an arrow. You're an arrow. Children, remember that. You're an arrow aimed at being a pillar and a sign. When you think of pillars in the church, we don't have any pillars here because this building doesn't need it. But in some buildings where they have, uh, if they don't have beams that go across, they have pillars. In the very long buildings, you'll see pillars, often built of stone. Uh, pillars of stone that support the structure of the building. And God wants people who are in His church to not just be members in that sense, but to be those who are pillars, those who are supporters, those who are wholeheartedly along in, in the church, in building up the church, in, in the activities of the church, and in the care for one another. And God wants you to be that when you grow up. He doesn't want you to just become a person who sits in the church and just, yeah, I'm a member of this church. I don't really, I'm, not, I'm there half the time. I'm not there. I feel like going. When I feel like going, I go. When I don't feel like going, I don't go. God wants you to be one who is wholeheartedly part of the church. And you can start on that pathway now. You can look up these verses about arrows. But I want to show you in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says about Timothy who grew up to become a pillar in the church. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that, you know, we read about Timothy. Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy took over the ministry of the mighty Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul had this wonderful ministry and then he handed it off, at least some of it, to Timothy. He says, now Timothy, you must continue because I'm going to go back to go up to heaven. Now it's your turn to continue. And you know when the work in Timothy's life started? When did the work in Timothy's life started? Let's read this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll read in verse 14. You, Timothy, this is Paul almost at the end of his life writing to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3 verse 14. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy may have been, I don't know, 30, something like that years old. And verse 15, that from childhood, you know that God was planning for Timothy to be a pillar in his church and, for, and to take over the ministry from Paul when he was six, eight, ten. There was Timothy sitting in the church and his mother was teaching, it says, teaching him some things. And he was sitting there in the church meetings and he could have been distracted, but he paid attention. It says that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. My dear young people, <laughs> my dear children, you are young people too. But little boys, little girls, God has a plan for your life. And whatever, and whatever that plan looks like, he wants, He's starting the work of preparation for that in you now while you are young. So it's so important to pay attention. He knew the scriptures from a young age, and that's why he could become useful in God's kingdom. So you are an arrow aimed at being a pillar and a sign. Let me show you this verse also in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Isaiah 8, verse 18. Isaiah 8 verse 18, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. You hear that? Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So you know, children, when your parents raise you up in a godly home, when you thank the Lord for your meals and you give thanks to Him like you guys, the, the preschool class did, and when you study your memory verses, when you're kind to others in your class, when you're kind to your friends because of the way you're being raised, you know what you are? You're a sign. There are other people around you who are being raised in very different types of homes with different values, different things that are, they're emphasizing, and you are a sign to them of how it should be, how God wants you to be as a young boy, as a young girl. So you are an arrow aimed at being a pillar and a sign. And this is for us parents as well. Remember that... This is the purpose with which God has given these arrows in us. Arrows to aim at that one day they have to be pillars in the church. One day, uh, and beginning now, these, our children, must be signs. Signs pointing to Christ. Okay, number six. Don't despise your parents' discipline. 
This is very important. I, I'll tell you honestly, children, I struggled with this when I was your age too. When my daddy or mommy would discipline me, correct me, and I was spanked uh, when I was a young boy, and I'm thankful for it. It protected me from a lot of danger, a lot of mistakes. I still made mistakes, unfortunately. But I can imagine what my life would have been like if my parents, who loved me so much, hadn't disciplined me and corrected me and rebuked me and spoken strongly to me when I was young. So when your parents correct you and discipline you, don't let any resentment come up towards them. I was tempted in that area and I believe Jesus was tempted as well. When they discipline you and after you get a punishment of some way, children, can you pay attention here for a moment real quick? I know we're gonna, I'm going to try to be done soon, okay? Listen to this carefully. When you're punished, I know this, what comes up within you is this, oh, I don't like my daddy or mommy. That temptation will come up. Why? It, you can't even hide it. I, I've seen it on my own children's faces um, at times when I punish them. That I can see what's going on inside. And it's so critical at that time, children, after you're punished, that, that doesn't find a seat in your heart where you don't allow that discipline that your parents who love you so much, don't allow it to have a, a, a foothold in your heart where you build a resentment towards your parents. Because that can grow and one day when you're a teenager or 20 something, you will hold on to that correction that your parents did out of love for you and it can damage your relationship with your parents. I've met young people like that. Now, as parents, we may not always do it correctly. But I'll tell you this, even if your parents do it un incorrectly, if you ask Jesus for help, He will give you help to have the right attitude towards your daddy and mommy when they correct you. So remember this, don't despise. Despise is a big word, maybe you don't understand it. Don't get angry at your parents when they correct you. If you find that going on in your heart, ask Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know my daddy and mommy love me and they've corrected me, they've not allowed me to do this or they've disciplined me in some way. Please help me to have the right attitude. Jesus will help you. It will go well with you in the long run. You can look up those verses in Hebrews 12 and Proverbs 22. <clears throat> Number seven, preserve your innocent dependence. David says, I long, he says, my heart is like a little child. I think of David, the reason he was a man after God's own heart. Because even though he became a king, you know when David was sitting there as a king, I think he looked out and saw a little kid and says, oh, I wish I could be a little kid again. David was a little kid at heart. He longed to go back and be the little shepherd boy again, even though he was a king ruling over all of Israel. He says, my heart is like a weaned child within me in Psalm 131. That's that verse. David longed to be able to go back and be like a little child in his relationship with God. And remember this, children, you're innocent. The world hasn't corrupted most of you yet in any way. You're young and you're innocent. And even though you're going to school and you're observing people who do things differently, and you'll see children who tell you, oh, it's fun to do this, or it's okay to fight, or it's okay to say this word. That's the world trying to corrupt your innocence. Don't let them. This is the most precious thing that you have as a young child, innocence. You haven't been tainted by the world yet. And you're dependent on your parents. You cannot go out and work a job and make a living. You, cannot, you don't even know how to drive cars, even though some of you want to yet. Maybe some of you guys do know how to drive cars. But these ones over here. And there's a dependence that's, that you have. That if, if us parents abandoned you, you would die. You wouldn't survive. And that's a good thing. That you're dependent on us for care, for nurture, for love. So don't lose that. Try to keep that in your heart, even though you will grow up to be young men, young women, take care of themselves. Um, and one day you will grow up and have families yourself. But in your heart, if you can preserve that innocence, it will go well with you. Okay, number eight. We're almost done, children. Number eight, obey, honor, and bless your parents. This is, there's a promise. If you want it to go well with you in your school, in your workplace, in whatever it is you're doing. If you want it to go well with you, obey your parents, honor them, honor your parents. It will go well with you. It will go well with you if you obey and honor your parents. And then it says in Proverbs 31, I want you to see this, children, and uh, adults too. Proverbs 31, it says about a godly woman. You know, often we talk about a godly wife, uh, uh, an excellent wife, but there's, some, there's an exhortation for children and for husbands in this chapter that we shouldn't miss. Husbands, I hope we haven't missed it. 
uh, and here it is in verse 28, towards the end, after he's talking about the beauty of a godly wife, a wonderful, a godly woman, he says in verse 28, her children rise up and bless her. Do that sometime, children. I hope you do that. Mommy, I love you. I'm so thankful for you. I hope God blesses your day today. And it says, you know, rise up. That means you stand up and you say it with a loud voice for your brothers and sisters who are here. Mommy, I love you and I, wa I want to bless your day. Do that today sometime. Or you'll shock your moms. But it'll be a good thing. And tomorrow, because your moms, they need blessing. If your mom has been these, and I, I believe every one of you has moms who have been like this to you and they've cared for you and loved you, sometime don't miss the blessing that God wants you to have by rising up and boldly saying, Mama, I bless you for what you've done for me. I thank you. And whatever, use your own words. Bless you. I, I, I hope God helps you today and strengthens you. And husbands, we're not off the hook either. Her husband also, and he praises her. He praises her. Let's, let's honor our wives and set a good example for our children so that they too are unashamed about blessing and honoring our, our wives and our mothers. Let's lavish them with praise. Number nine, always tell the truth. You know, the reason this is so important, always tell the truth. Do you know that every lie has a father? Children, listen to this really carefully. Every lie has a father. When you're in a tight situation and daddy or mommy ask you, did you do that or who did that? You could lie. And if you think, if I lie, I'll get away. I won't get the punishment. I to they told me not to eat the cookie, but I didn't know they would count that there was exactly 23 cookies. I thought they would notice that one was gone. And it looks nicely arranged, but they're going to look and say, hey, there's one missing. And you could be t you're tempted in that situation. I could lie. Who ate the cookie? And they'll never find out. Maybe you hid it really well. You covered it up and they would never find out. But you know that every lie has a father. Every lie has an origin. And Jesus said in John 8, 44, the father of all lies is who? The devil. The devil is the father of all lies. And when you are tempted to tell a lie, the devil is the one who made that lie and he asks you to be a part of it. And to tell that lie in partnership with him, together with him, don't let him. And so when, in those situations, I know it's difficult, children, but I'll tell you this. If you speak the truth, God will always bless you. You, you may get into a little bit of trouble for what, what went wrong, for the wrong thing that you did. But that will be just for a short period of time. Later on in life, you will get such blessing if you tell the truth. Always tell the truth. It is always better to tell the truth. You can ask all of us adults. We've all told lies at some point in our lives and it's always ended up badly because then you have to tell another lie to cover it up and then you have to tell another lie to cover it, and you have to tell another lie and you have to build a life of lies and one day it all comes crashing down and you're kind of there and it's all exposed. It happens to even some famous preachers. They've told lie after lie after lie and covered it up, covered it up and they think I'm getting away with it. Nobody knows that I'm living this secret sinful life. And then it all gets exposed. You can save yourself, children, from any of those things happening to you if you learn to tell the truth in every situation. Yes, I'll tell you this, it may be a little bit painful. It probably will be a little bit painful because you'll face some consequences. But in the long run, down the road, it will go well with you. God will be able to bless you and He will honor you. He will, he will take care of you. And even if you have to face those consequences for something very serious that you've done, when you tell the truth, it will go well with you. Okay, we're on our last one. Smiles. We're on our last one. <laughs> okay. The last one, children, is this. Sorry, I had that. John 8, 44, always tell the truth. The last one is this. Always be content. See, we, we live in a world where God allows different ones of us and different people in the world to have different things. There are some very, very rich people that have a lot of things. Many cars, big houses fancy clothes, and all of those things. And there are others in this world who don't have any clothes. And you and I are somewhere in between this. Right, children? There are children in the world who have no food at all to eat and no clothes to wear. They don't have a house above their, any kind of house to live in. And then there are others who have amazing amounts of money. I'll tell you, none of these is, is, um, is uh, a hindrance 
or a benefit to having a good life. God wants to see that you have contentment. Whatever you have, if it's the same clothes that your older sister wore or your older brother wore, or it's the same shoes that somebody else wore and it looks a little torn or worn out and you see somebody else in your school or in the church that has new shoes and you're jealous or you wish you had that or you wish you could have had that thing that they have. The world is constantly trying to tell you that you will be happier if you have those nice things. Remember this, the way to happiness is contentment. Whatever you have, if you need new shoes, ask your parents. But if they say, sorry, you have to wear those for a little bit longer, that's fine. If you can be content with what you have in your life now, you will be so happy, dear children. If you can be content with what you have, whatever your God has allowed your family to have, and be content with that, and be satisfied with that, and say, thank you, Lord, for what you had. Think of somebody else that you see even as you drive. Think of somebody else that has less than you and you'll be thankful. Look around, there are homeless people you'll see. There are people who are much poorer than any of us. Read, ask your parents to tell you some stories of some real poor countries where they have nothing at all and how they would long for even a piece of bread. Whether no butter or nothing, just a piece of bread. And when you think about that, it'll make you thankful for who you are, what you have. And if you can be thankful and can be content with what God has allowed you to have, you'll be very, very happy. Okay, now I tried my best to explain it in as simple terms as possible. If you didn't understand any of it, please ask your parents or come and ask me. I'd be happy to answer more questions. Um, a few of you have questions now, maybe for a couple minutes. Yes, Raymond. Parents, parents have, like, people come on that always eat rice and they always have a rice bowl. There are people in India, yes, especially who all they eat is rice every single day. Rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Actually, probably just two meals a day, rice. And they live on a rice farm, and all they eat is rice every day. You're right. When we think about them, we can be thankful. Anybody else have a question you'd like to ask me? Think about these things, children, and uh, go over them with your parents. If you have any other questions, you can ask them. I'm going to pray with us, and then we will open it up for sharing time, uh, brothers and sisters. If you have any way that you'd like to bless our children or memory verses you want to say, we can continue as we normally do. Father, I thank you for these children. I thank you for how they, they take an interest in the things of this church and how they blessed us so wonderfully with the skits and their memory verses, how they do that faithfully. The wonderful example they are. Help us, Lord, to never miss the glory that we have right here in our midst in these children. Bless them. Preserve them. I pray that every single one of them will be your disciple. Will we'll begin this journey, if they haven't yet, of walking with you wholeheartedly. Will commit their lives completely to you and know that the most satisfying life they can live is the life of a disciple. In Jesus' name. Amen.